My name is Diana zu Löwen. I'm here at the YouTube studio at the Munich Security Conference together with Cassie Kajolaid, former president of Estonia. Do you want to tell us what is your motivation to be here this year? Well, uh, I was just thinking, this year, out of the six times I've been here, I've actually gotten most out of this conference uh, as far as thinking and informing myself uh, is concerned because if you're not in the office then of course there are no bilateral meetings or at least there are less of them. So I've been more free to choose my own schedule and uh, it's been really uh, interesting. But of course this year we have had a Let's say it's been Munich Security Conference, but it's all been about Ukraine. So you may call it also the Ukrainian Security Conference in Munich, which will be, I think, more appropriate. And um, what is, let's say, one of the biggest maybe takeouts or learnings from this year? Well, we have to wait with the learnings, I'm afraid. Uh, there have been many interesting uh, ideas floated also about Ukraine. And many interesting ideas floated about how Europe could fast forward and do more uh, on its defense. What struck me actually this morning that I've uh, discussed a lot with uh, my European colleagues and, uh, and also, for example, Natalie Totsi, who was moderating the Europeans this morning, this uh, possibility to spend more together on our defense uh, capabilities, not trotting on the, uh, on the toes of NATO, because NATO is about uh, capabilities, aligning them up, uh, making them interoperate, etc. But Europe is really good at redistribution and cohesion. And uh, Natalie herself mentioned that um, we have PESCO and we have CARD, but we have no appropriate uh, mechanism to make sure that we actually spend more together and it was first time I sensed uh, there was an acceptance to this kind of idea on the panel, which uh, consisted of the French and German uh, ministers of defense and uh, High Representative Joseph Borrell. I was also uh, deeply moved by uh, the strong uh, voice of Charles Michel, uh, making sure that we do not waver in our belief that finally the good will prevail, mm -hmm. that uh, the liberal democracies will prevail. And which has become crystal clear here is that um, Russia is of course not afraid of NATO's troops. Otherwise, why gather all your troops below uh, Belarus uh, and uh, leave nothing up north where you have really the border of NATO countries? But what he really is afraid of is, uh, is democracies. Mm. And uh, there is even more the reason, therefore, to make sure that... Uh, we use also the geopolitical power of the European Union to actually show that you cannot bully a nation which uh, stood up for their right to live in a free world, in democracy, under EU flags. The only thing you achieve by doing this is fast-forwarding, mm -hmm. accelerating this process of uh, supporting Ukraine on its path to the European Union. Personally, I think it could be in EU's history one of the strongest geopolitical signals it could give ever if it decided now in the Council to give the European perspective mm. to Ukraine. Yes, it will be 30-something chapters away, decades maybe more away. We all have been through uh, this uh, accession procedure in Eastern Europe. We know it takes a decade. Uh, yes, it will be strongly conditional because the European Union does not accept new member states who have not uh, fulfilled all the necessary criteria. But geopolitically, to give an emergency signal now, because of what Russia has been doing, we accelerate the procedures and start them maybe from a slightly wrong end. Mm -hmm. Normally, you have already to be more or less ready to be invited. We can invite and then help to prepare this time. Because I believe that extraordinary times and risks uh, demand uh, extraordinary uh, measures as well. But that's uh, quite an optimistic view, which is uh, kind of nice to hear, uh, to have like a more, let's say, hopeful perspective. Um, what I uh, am also really curious about is um, Estonia is a country that is really uh, digitalized. Uh, you have so many, uh, you have an e-citizenship and sometimes it feels like Germany or other countries are years ahead. Is there anything that is already established in Estonia where you'd say every European country, uh, country needs this? 
But uh, every European country has recognized they need this <laughs> because during German presidency, by the way, European Union decided uh, that each and every citizen of the Union has the right to a digital identity which is safe, secure and has a guarantee by its state and in addition is ADAS compatible. Why is this important? Because that way our identities will also work cross-border. Uh, this is extremely important. And I do believe indeed that the Estonian example catalyzing uh, this uh, process uh, has been present. I remember our own uh, EU Council Presidency when I had the chance to present to uh, the heads of state uh, what we have done and why I believe that there is actually no option for governments to remain out of this because our people act and transact online and the governments cannot be the last ones who, uh, who give this opportunity to communicate with them online if they do not want to feel somewhat obsolete to their own citizens. So uh, I'm very happy that uh, this process, which uh, we started in Tallinn, uh, then brought us to, uh, to this decision. But we also have to take care that our connections are secure. Therefore, ADAS is important, but there is another element. Uh, in 21st century, in this geopolitically difficult situation which we are today, we must not forget that there is another, maybe more hidden conflict going on. But the fact is that who controls the greed, who controls the technology, Mm -hmm. They are the winners of this century. Therefore, we must also make sure that our uh, interconnections can be trusted, that technology does what it is told to be done, and also that it doesn't do anything else and additional. Hence, trusted connectivity is extremely important, and Estonia is trying to promote this uh, through European Union, through digital summits, through Free Seas Initiative, through OCD, wherever possible, because I believe this is indeed a more slowly emerging uh, mm. um, conflict, but uh, we have to win it. Do you also mean the power of uh, companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple? Is there anything the European Union should do to maybe create own let's say, unicorns in the tech world? Well, the risk, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the risk from Google's and Amazon's and market concentration is definitely far lower than the risk from our, uh, our communication lines being controlled mm. by an autocratic power, so I wouldn't actually compare okay. these two. Uh, but what concerns uh, companies then, first and foremost, I believe that uh, Web3, which is uh, far more decentralized, might actually do away with uh, market concentration but we must make sure that it truly does. So this is one element. The other element indeed is that uh, we should, uh, and we are to a certain extent already regulating, for example, data privacy laws in Europe have to apply wherever you come from, and uh, they have to apply. And, uh, and the whole world, I believe, has accepted Europe as a standard set in privacy issues. So we need to continue this work. And for me personally, I think that uh, all these companies, if they had the tools, by European Union member states, mm. which actually were the digital identities of their citizens, would find it far easier to also drive anonymity out of the greed, because accusing uh, Facebook that people are anonymous online is unfair. It's government's job to provide passports and, and uh, guarantee their legal safety. So we have the tools to help companies to make internet uh, space more safe. And of course, there are well-known well measures to make sure that the market does not get too concentrated. Uh, we can apply them all. And I see Europe here as a standard setter in privacy and also a standard setter in e-governance services mm -hmm. because no other continent has set itself such an objective to have their government service run online. Can you talk a little bit more about what you said regarding Web 3.0? Because I know it's a topic a lot of people currently talk about, but I still think a lot of people can't really envision how it could look like. So could I have my identity, uh, my digital identity on the blockchain? And that's also how I log into uh, governmental services? I think it would be fully uh, possible indeed that the next generation of uh, digital identities doesn't need to be car chips, uh, well, we have mobile ID, smart ID. There has to be several versions of access anyway. This is, by the way, an element of security, that if something happens to one, uh, one element of, uh, of digital ID, then you can still rely on the others. Uh, this is very important. And indeed, blockchain offers uh, many opportunities also for the governments to offer, for example, proactive services, which means that the uh, system itself will decide based on an event in, uh, in a person's life. Uh, to adjust some data, some registries, and maybe maybe support the person based on this uh, this uh, well 
the development in their mm -hmm. life. For example, if you have a child in Estonia, people are very often asking that. I mean, government knows I had a baby. Government knows my bank account because I pay taxes and so on. Government knows I'm now entitled to child support because our child support system is not means tested, so everybody gets it. Mm. So the fact that the baby is registered could automatically, I mean, uh, unclench the procedure of paying uh, child support mm. to the parents. Uh, why should people even go there and ask? Uh, so this kind of proactive systems uh, well, do demand uh, blockchain technologies to make sure that all registries are always, uh, always uh, up to date. Normal procedures in Estonia, we run on a different uh, keyless signature infrastructure technology because if you're just querying, blockchain is too heavy a tool. Uh, if you are adap uh, adjusting, then of course it is different. I mean, uh, there are also countries like El Salvador, right, that have um, that use uh, Bitcoin as a currency. Do you think this is uh, also realistic for European countries? Here I am uh, on the conservative side. While I do admit uh, the value of also uh, for people to uh, valorize or monetize, for example, their creativity in the art uh, using NFTs and, and all this, uh, the risk of inflation in the system is huge, as we are already know. I believe art market is maybe the best example. Yeah. I mean, how the prices are actually uh, actually moving up very fast, which is kind of natural if everybody can issue a currency, then inflation is unlimited. So I'm not so sure how we could actually, I mean, align this world somehow with our, uh, with our uh, monetary systems and models, because there are leakages both ways. People pay in real money and they exchange their, yeah. their, uh, their uh, virtual money for, their, for the real money back. We have to somehow analyze and understand this process more. But what is my worry is that no technology should be punished if people are using the technology to do maybe things which we do not think are appropriate. And I don't think people do it only because the, they, they are criminals, but simply, I mean, there are new technological opportunities and we we need to make sure that they use these technologies uh, where we can and not punish technology as such uh, for, for, for the uh, maybe developments which we do not like. There is a high risk, but we have to remember that even in the most archaic technologies, let's take an axe. An axe can be used to chop wood and an axe can be used to kill people. Mm. So nothing has changed in this, this sense. So uh, never, never actually accuse technology. And um, you already said that you trust more in the, let's say, stable uh, um, uh, economic systems for also when it comes to um, people paying their pension, let's say. And our world has become so much more volatile as well as the stock markets. Um, can you tell or talk a little bit more about the topic, how people in, in this current situation can still um, yeah, save money for pension if the markets are so volatile? I'm definitely not going to give anybody an investment <laughs> advice here, uh, here online <laughs> because indeed uh, there has been quite a lot of uh, liquidity sloshing around in the system and of course it had two places to go. I mean all kinds of assets including real estate assets yeah. and I'm actually worried uh, by one development uh, of this process and I've been long worried about it because I believe it hurts people's self-esteem and self-confidence that uh, because so much of our value is accumulating in real estate uh, it's not anymore uneducated lowly paid people who cannot get up the property ladder and uh, and we are helping people uh, by governments to live in social apartments and so on particularly in uh, in uh, most expensive cities of Europe and, and I think we need to somehow remedy this unbalance which currently is, is developing, that we have a wide tax base, which means that, I mean, everybody from poor to middle class pays into our tax systems and mm. proportionately probably middle class more than, uh, than anybody else. And then we dole out social support even to people who are full-time working and even more and more to people who are educated. I mean, police, nurses, they cannot afford to buy an apartment in Paris or in London. Uh, and, and also people working in private sector, those who make our pizzas and coffees. And we somehow need to get government out from this and rebalance this that, I mean, actually, I mean, people get the salary based on which they can make a decent living. We can calculate, and I know OECD is actually trying to understand this, this problem. I mean, what could be the real cost of labor mm. uh, in various parts of our developed, uh, developed uh, countries? It, it isn't national, it's definitely regional issue. To, to kind of help to start this discussion that, I mean, we could stop this circle that we are 
actually paying in taxes, then expensively redistributing and always unfairly redistributing mm. because this is always unfair. And at the same time, then subsidizing all employers, including state itself, but also private employers, because uh, in your benefit to somebody who made my, my pizza is actually a pizza subsidy for me who bought it, yeah. isn't it? So we somehow have to uh, resolve this, uh, this uh, negative circle because I believe if people cannot afford for their salary, full-time work, even higher education, to I mean, have a decent lifestyle, then this actually is breaking our societies. And I believe that Gilets Jaunes and all these movements actually demonstrate that we are on the brink. That's, that's a huge uh, topic or an important topic, especially for more equality. I wish I could talk a lot more uh, with you about the, these topics and even more. Um, but... Um, there is like another discussion going on. But thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you. And maybe we'll see each other next year as well. <laughs> thank I you. definitely hope to be here also next year and to continue discussions also on new technologies because I'm now on MSC Innovation Board. And I hope that we'll have more space for more developmental issues and less crisis-related uh, issues. But I also want to warn us that I need to seek very quick solutions will normally be not good solutions for us. So I really want to support the uh, Foreign Minister Anna-Lena Baerbock, who said this is a marathon, this crisis is a marathon. So maybe we will be by next year at the 30th kilometer of this marathon, I hope at least. <laughs>